welcome everyone. Uh, please join me this evening as I would like to present an alternative view of some typographic innovations. Nowadays, Johannes Gutenberg is considered the founder of Western typography. In the 1400s, demand for books had risen sharply, but making copies by hand was a slow, laborious process left to the scribes. When Gutenberg invented movable type, he was planning to beat the scribes at their own game. He wanted to produce books of comparable quality and look, but much faster than the scribes ever could. Around 1450, when he produced this printed edition of the Bible, he created the typeface that replicated the scribes' handwriting as closely as possible. As we can see from this close-up, Gutenberg meticulously imitated the scribes' style, including their abbreviations and other writing conventions. He even added colored decorations as they did in their manuscripts. But Gutenberg never intended to create a new class of letter forms to be used exclusively for printed matter. He didn't imagine that in the future, people would compete to design families of letter forms that would never be written by hand. Here we see the printed edition of Bembo's work, De Etna, from the year 1495, less than 50 years after Gutenberg's Bible. The typeface in this book would have looked alien to Gutenberg. Building on Gutenberg's movable type, a new craft was born. As commonly happens with a successful invention, others feel free to use it in different ways that its inventor never foresaw. With this in mind, I would like to propose that we envision Gutenberg as an unwitting sorcerer who makes the brew in his cauldron, unaware what it would ultimately bring forth or that it would be passed down to his successors. In this brew, Gutenberg threw numerous elements, many of which we now consider crucial and essential to typography. These include letter forms that are based on a pattern, paper as a medium, ink as a pigment to render letter forms visible, lines composed of letters, galleys that hold all the composed lines in place, enabling repeated printing of any given page. As the craft of typography evolved over the centuries, Gutenberg's successors invented new techniques to solve various problems. Unknowingly, they added new elements to the sorcerer's brew. Like their predecessors, these new elements churned in the brew and brought forth what no one could have foretold at the time. Since we can't list all typographic innovators, let's pick out a few that have made pivotal changes to the field. Let's start with this man in the 15th century, Francesco Grifo, also known as Francesco da Bologna. After refining his craft at various places in Venice, Grifo joined Aldo Manuzio's workshop as a punch cutter. Manuzio publicly lauded Grifo, recognizing his exceptional talent. Because of its narrow letter forms, because its narrow letter forms can fit more text on a page, Griffo decided one day to create a typeface based on chancery handwriting around the year 1500, roughly 50 years after Gutenberg's Bible. In this sample, it's interesting to note that the capital letters do not appear in chancery style. If we look at the sample, you see various 
capitals that are in a typical upright style. Unbeknownst to him, Griffo flung this leaning style into the bubbling brew, oblivious to its long-term reverberations. Little did he know that with the passing of time, his typeface would come to be called Italic, referring to its geographic origin on the Italian peninsula. Even more unthinkable to Griffo would be the eventual pairing of Italic style as a complement to the upright style within a typeface family, a concept that by now we have espoused as a natural part of typography. In fact, by the mid 1700s, about 200 years after Griffo's original italic design, this pairing was becoming conventional, as evidenced here by this specimen of Caslon's work. Note that the left side, the upright letters, have been entitled as Roman, and the right side as italic. Roman came to mean upright and leaning styles were labeled as italic. The flaring ends at the stem was an inherent characteristic typical of Roman letters, evidence of the chisel used to engrave them. If we look at some of these letter forms, you can see, for example, here at the top and bottom of the I, at the edges of the D on the V, this visual feature was retained in the classical letter forms that were ultimately absorbed into typographic practice, where it remained a frequent but relatively quiet guest. In the late 1700s, Giambattista Bodoni came along and stretched the serif, reducing it to the thickness of a slice of Parma prosciutto. In doing so, he had transformed what was once a secondary feature into a primary one. One could say that Budoni had made the serif a thing. With these changes, the serif received new attention and tumbled helplessly into the simmering brew. As various type designers came along and altered the shape of the serif to suit their taste, the differences became very evident and were associated with specific styles. Little did Budoni know that one day in the 20th century, a common typographic classification scheme would use the shape of the serif as a principal parameter. Would Budoni have ever imagined that his own typeface would be classified as modern? Moving forward to the end of the 19th century, demand for printed material had risen to new unprecedented levels. Noting this unmet demand, Lynn Boyd Benton astutely recognized an important bottleneck in the publishing cycle. The manual engraving of metal punches in different sizes slowed the process of creating new type. By means of his invention, the Benton pantograph, punches for various sizes of type could be engraved based on a single pattern. Not only that, but the letter forms could also be condensed, extended, or even slanted. We can see in the illustration here, the pattern for the larger letter, the smaller, the smaller rendering on the punch, and these various axes that could be manipulated for scale and compression. Did Benton know that he was hurling the element of scale into the simmering brew? Did he imagine that letter forms would eventually be scaled using light and lenses? Or that later on, 
the latter forms would even be defined as polynomial curves that can be scaled by means of matrix transformations. Benton could not have envisioned that the concept behind this pantograph would be applied to new non-physical models of letters. Benton, of course, wasn't alone in pondering the bottlenecks in the preparation of, the, of printed matter at the end of the 19th century, of the 1900s. Two other astute observers detected an even greater bottleneck than the making of punches. Of punches. The manual composing of lines out of individual letters was extremely time consuming. As we can see in this illustration, this is the way lines were composed manually in a composing stick. One of these observers was Otmar Mergenthaler, who later founded the, the Linotype Company, while the other was Tolbert Lanston, inventor of the monotype machine. Using different approaches, the linotype and monotype machines mechanized the composition of lines, accelerating beyond measure the typesetting process by eliminating the composing stick and rendering obsolete the drawers of the upper and lower cases. Until the middle of the 20th century, metal served to imprint the image of the letter form. Along came two French engineers, Igonet and Moirou, with a new idea. Why resort to metal patterns when light can imprint letter forms on film? We were already in the epoch of, the, of photography. The era of photocomposition was about to be launched. Light not only eliminated the need for metal letter forms, but also made galleys nearly weightless and also chased lead fumes away from the, from the composing room. In addition, text imaged on film fits seamlessly into the process of lithographic printing. If a simmering sorcerer's brew can convert metal into photons, what else might it be able to do? Maybe Igonet and Moirou knew that light would further insinuate itself into the business of typography. Since its inception, typeset type text has been presented on paper, its primary medium, just as it had formed the image of letters on film, light came to do the same on CRT screens by the 1970s. In the 1980s, the early WYSIWYG screens show the lower resolution proof of typeset lines, while a laser printer or film setter produced the final higher resolu resolution copy. At the time, two perceptive type designers, Chris Holmes and Charles Bigelow, realized a technological shift was underway. The role of the screen was in flux. Bigelow and Holmes surmised that the screen wasn't destined to remain in a secondary role as a proofing tool for images rendered on paper, but it was becoming a new medium in its own right. With this realization in mind, they designed the Lucida family of typefaces to look good even on the screens of that period. And here we see a sample of the various weights they had come up with for early Lucida designs. The brew bubbled and gave birth to a new medium. Today we live in a visual world where we are increasingly dependent on the medium of the screen for all sorts of information. Many of us now read more published material on screen than we do on paper. Screen resolution is high and rising. Type is sharper than ever. The photons are overtaking the pigment.
Dear Johannes Gutenberg, just a short note to bring you the latest news. Letter forms are now made of polynomial curves that we can scale, stretch, and compress as we please. They have replaced the metal punches and molds. Light is the new pigment. Maybe news of LED screens has reached you? Lines are composed of phantom characters lined up next to each other. Galleys don't weigh a ton anymore, and we now call them PDFs. Recently, somebody even invented a new flexible galley that's called HTML. By the way, thanks for the good brew. More than 500 years later, it's still simmering. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? So I have a question, uh, Kamal. So yes. You, uh, you did the chronology from the beginning until uh, today. What will happen in the future? We will have to ask the brew what it will spit out. <laughs> so is there anything in the brew now that will come up in the future in some different way we don't uh, expect? That, well, uh, we can only speak of what we can imagine. Well, we're already seeing the, the change in that we now have a very prominent multiple media publishing the, the typeset word. Um, I remember very clearly when the, the word on the screen was most unpleasant to read and was meant to be temporary. Um, it may not be perfect today, but we're certainly moving in the direction of further refinement all the time. People are now beginning to think of how best to arrange text on a smaller screen and so on. Questions that are still very, uh, very new and uh, not fully explored. Okay, thank you very much, Kamal. Ah, I have a, we have a question. Thank you. Um, I, I I wanted to say two things. Um, one is I, I think it's very well attested um, from paleographical and book history evidence that um, many of the um, letter forms in early print came from manuscript. I mean, Italic, Roman, these were humanist hands um, based on Carolingian minuscule, um, which is, you know, pre-print. Um, but but the the quibble that I'd like to make um, is is on the claim that these typographical innovations are um, are unknowing on the part of the typographers. Um, I mean, certainly early modern typographers wrote extensively on their innovations. There are plenty of treatises describing um, the ideal proportions of letter forms um, and. I mean, we just heard um, in the previous talk uh, an example of a modern typographer thinking very carefully about the um, the impact that a writing system can have, and and thinking carefully on how that writing system might be developed and changed. Um, so I just wanted to to ask um, um, if you uh, do, do you truly really think this is um, simply happening, or um, are you will you afford a bit of allowance to the the agency of on the part of the typographer? No, I agree with you. The innovators were fully intentional. I, I do not undermine the intention and the focus of their innovations. Um, what I'm pointing out with a bit of humor is that they almost never predicted all the consequences of what they were doing. So I'm sure that 
uh, Budoni made made that serif thin because it pleased him in some way. He thought this was appropriate. He never realized that doing so would actually get other people focusing on manipulating the appearance of the serif to be different from other designers. Or Griffo, for example, um, I'm sure he thought the typeface was good looking and obviously it followed as much as, as possible the, um, the style of chancery, the cancelleresco, but he never in, intended to, for that to turn into the paired complement to upright designs. So um, I'm not undermining their inventions in any way. I'm just saying that as they invented something new and very intentional, very often uh, the same strain uh, reappears in other ways or is redirected by other people to other purposes, uh, sometimes even much later in time than they could have imagined. Okay, uh, before giving the microphone to uh, Mark Kuster, I just wanted to add that um, uh, Bodoni, it wasn't just pleasure, it was Italian extravaganza. He said, <laughs> I will do the thinnest serif. <laughs> Nobody will be able to, to do something uh, more imp uh, impressive than that. <laughs> that. That's why I made the reference to the prosciutto di Parma. <laughs> he wanted it to be as thin as a slice of that. Okay, um, now if Gutenberg uh, actually thought he was improving on manuscript uh, and created something fundamentally new, are we actually still in the age of uh, Gutenberg or haven't we uh, uh, invented in the 90s uh, something, a new brew to stay in your metaphor that is uh, yes, uh, has some ingredients of the brew before, but it's still a fundamentally different uh, type of uh, medicine. Firstly, I would almost uh, think this is the case, that actually uh, after 500 years, uh, we had another break that is perhaps bigger than uh, the previous break even. And is changing society in ways that are at least as fundamental as the one Gutenberg uh, brought about. Yes, I, I would agree very, very much. And also, um, perhaps I should have emphasized this point, uh, Gutenberg started by imitating handwriting. And then as typography developed, new forms were created that were uh, good looking, but still very suited to uh, the characteristics of metal and the fact that uh, 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 molds could not overlap each other. Um, we are breaking that barrier now since our letter forms are polynomial and we are able to uh, create script fonts based on handwriting. Letter forms can overlap with neighbor, neighboring ones. There's no metal to break. So um, I think uh, just the technology itself um, will help us break down this very strict wall between typographic and handwritten style. Okay, thank you very much, Kamal. Thank you.